In late 1939, Germany's Austrian giant Krupp unveiled a monster, the 8cm Schwerer Gustav railway cannon. Designed to take out the heavy fortifications of the Maginot Line, Gustav weighed 1,350 metric tons and could launch a 7-ton high-explosive shell up to 47 kilometers, making it the largest mobile artillery piece ever built. Yet despite its truly gargantuan dimensions, in terms of destructive power, Gustav was dwarfed by another gun developed a decade later, despite being considerably smaller, which packed the atomic punch of the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is the story of the M65 Atomic Annie, America's Cold War nuclear cannon. The origins of the M65 lie in the earliest days of the Cold War, when a Soviet invasion of Western Europe appeared imminent. At this time, nuclear doctrine had not yet escalated into the global suicide pact of mutually assured destruction, and military planners believed that the limited use of small tactical nuclear weapons would be a decisive factor on the modern battlefield, particularly for stopping mass formations of Soviet troops and tanks from storming across the border. But with guided missile technology still in its infancy, the most reliable and accurate means of delivering such weapons was with conventional artillery. So, in the late 1940s, the U.S. Army requested the development of a mobile field gun capable of firing an atomic shell. This request was vehemently opposed by the U.S. Air Force, which was fighting to gain control over all American nuclear weapons. After all, they argued no grounds commander would dare store nuclear shells anywhere close to the front lines for fear of them being captured by the enemy, meaning the warheads would have to be flown to the front just prior to firing. Furthermore, selection and scouting of potential targets would also likely be carried out by aircraft so why not cut out the middleman and just hand over nuclear delivery to the Air Force? The Army fired back, pointing to incidents during the Second World War where friendly aircraft had accidentally bombed American positions or where weather had prevented them from flying altogether. As then Secretary of the Army Frank Pace argued, an atomic gun can give the ground commander tremendous firepower at his fingertips and directly under his control. Like conventional artillery, it would be especially effective in defending against attacking ground forces obliged to mass and expose themselves in an assault. Unlike piloted aircraft, the atomic gun can function in all weather, day or night. It is essentially an artillery piece, but with immeasurably greater power than any artillery hitherto known. In the end, the Army's view won out, and following a 1949 meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Army's Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey was officially tasked with developing an atomic gun. While the Air Force and other detractors continued to oppose this development, secretly they doubted the weapon would ever see the light of day, for it was then thought impossible to build a nuclear warhead small enough to fit in an artillery shell. However, this notion was obliterated in March 1952 during a large military exercise in Texas codenamed Operation Longhorn. As a group of soldiers representing enemy forces were preparing for an attack, an artillery shell burst overhead, releasing a harmless puff of white smoke. Thinking little of it, the ground commander carried on with his preparations, only for an exercise referee to announce over the radio, Sir, 1,600 of these men are out of action due to an airburst of an atomic artillery shell. This announcement seemed to confirm that engineers had finally cracked the problem of miniaturizing a nuclear weapon. And indeed, on September 29, 1952, the Army's new atomic gun, the T-131 Termite, was unveiled to the public. Based on the German K-5 railway gun used during the Second World War, the T-131 sported a 280mm bore barrel and weighed 85 metric tons. For transport, the gun was suspended between two specially designed T-72 four-wheel tractors, each capable of producing 375 horsepower and driving at speeds of up to 56 km per hour on good roads. The two tractors were independently driven, with the two drivers coordinating their movements via intercom. The whole 26 meter long assembly was designed to pass through narrow European village roads and over most bridges could be deployed from a landing ship and was operated by a crew of just seven men who could prepare the gun for firing or return it to traveling configuration in less than 15 minutes. Once lowered from the tractors, the T-131 rested on a large ball and socket joint, which was so well balanced that it only took four men to traverse the gun around 360 degrees. The fine traversing and elevation mechanisms were equally well balanced, allowing the gun to be aimed using hand wheels in the event the hydraulic systems failed. To absorb the enormous recoil of firing, the T-131 featured a clever two-stage mechanism whereby the barrel reciprocated in its mountains while the top sections of the carriage slid over the bottom, absorbing 90% and 10% of the recoil, respectively. Capable of elevating its barrel up to 55 degrees, the weapon had a range of between 11 and 56 kilometers, and while at such distances, gunners had to account for minute factors like the slight droop 
of the barrel and the rotation of the earth, they nonetheless achieved a surprising level of accuracy. As Major James Miller, who later operated the weapon in Germany, recalled, even though we fired at ranges of 1 to 20 miles, we almost always hit within 1 to 20 yards of the target at worst. When firing a 20 kiloton weapon, that much error was acceptable. But for all the atomic cannon's clever engineering, the projectile it fired, the TE-124 shell, was an even greater technological wonder. Like the little boy bomb that destroyed Hiroshima, the T-124, also known as the W-9, was a gun-type warhead using a propellant charge to propel one piece of enriched uranium into another to create a supercritical assembly. It also had the same explosive yield as Little Boy, equivalent to 15 kilotons of TNT while weighing 11 times less. Indeed, at 280 millimeters in diameter and 1,390 millimeters long, the W-9 was among the smallest nuclear weapons ever built, beaten only by the later W-33 and W-79 8-inch nuclear artillery shells and the W-54 warhead used in the AIM-26 Falcon air-to-air -air missile, the Davy Crockett recallless rifle, and the man-portable special atomic demolition munition, or or Sadom. In October 1952, the first T-131 cannon was demonstrated to the public firing inert shells at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, while three months later, on January 20, 1953, the weapon took part in the inaugural parade of newly elected U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, earning it the nickname Big Ike. But the greatest demonstration of the T-131's abilities came on May 25 of that year, when it conducted the first, and thus far only, firing of a live nuclear artillery shell as part of Operation Upshot Knothole at Frenchman Flag at the Nevada test site. By this time, the weapon had been redesignated the M65, though its crews affectionately referred to it as Atomic Annie. This is likely a reference to Anzio Annie, the nickname given to a pair of German K5 railway guns which shelled American positions during the 1943 Allied invasion of Italy. As the minutes ticked down to the live test fire, observers grew increasingly anxious, fearing that the extreme forces of firing would rip the delicate warhead apart as it left the barrel, at best scattering precious uranium over the test site, and at worst prematurely detonating and vaporizing the gun and its crew. As weapon specialist Colonel Donald L. Harrison later recalled, at the Nevada Proving Grounds, for the real test, I was located at the gun position. My duties there were that of a super chief of section, checking deflections, quadrants, and fuse settings, and ensuring that fire commands were executed properly. During preliminary firings, there was a few misfires. It was determined that these misfires were caused by faulty ignition wires in the primers. Consequently, all primers were checked for electrical continuity before use. I had the task of physically ramming out the atomic projectile in case of a misfire. I gave a big sigh of relief when the activated cannon rounds cleared the tube with only the big shell's thunderous noise. In the end, the test firing, codenamed Grable, went perfectly. At 8.30 a.m., the shell detonated 11 kilometers away at an altitude of 160 meters, with the resulting mushroom cloud rising 10.6 kilometers into the atmosphere. The dramatic footage of the test has since become iconic and has been featured in dozens of documentaries and other works. In the wake of the upshot knothole Grable test, the Army approved the adoption of 20 M65 cannons, which were manufactured at the Waterton and Waterville-led arsenals in New York State. The weapons were first delivered to the United States Army Field Artillery School at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where a unit called the 867th Field Artillery Battalion was formed to train gun crews and develop procedures and tactics for deploying the M65. At the same time, weapons engineers urged the Army to halt development of the M65 as smaller 8-inch atomic shells compatible with existing artillery pieces were being developed. Needing a functional weapon in the interim, however, the Army carried on with the M65. Under the command of Colonel Devere Armstrong, the 867th spent a year working out the kinks in the M65 system. Then, in April 1955, three more atomic artillery battalions, the 264th, the 265th, and the 868th, were formed for deployment overseas. The 867th was sent to Okinawa and then South Korea to enforce the July 27, 1953 armistice, while the rest were deployed to Germany to hold off a potential Soviet invasion. Almost immediately, however, the shortcomings of the M65 quickly became apparent. As Lieutenant Colonel James Thompson later recorded of his experiences in Germany, all of us who served with the 280 units often referred to the monsters as Widowmakers. Although my battery developed and executed many intricate maneuvers with the weapon on a hard surface, it was highly immobile off the hard surface. One anxious moment occurred when it became necessary to halt on a slight incline to the side on ice-covered grounds. The entire gun unit, its carriage and transporters started to gradually slide sideways toward a ravine. In a desperate attempt to get more traction, we quickly dropped the gun to the ground from the transports. It worked, and it bought us time to figure out how to get back into the traveling position. From that experience, we learned that the gun could not be listed from the firing position to the transports on slightly uneven grounds. We learned to overcome that obstacle by lifting the gun clear of the ground and gingerly moving the units to a surface even enough to allow the lifting forks to swing into position to insert the traveling locks. 
Driving the transporters was tricky. Great care had to be taken to ensure complete coordination between them. Also, the mechanical rammer was extremely quick. The ammo loading davit could easily swing out of control while lifting the giant shell, and there were other things I could go on about. I can proudly say there were no casualty causing incidents while I was in command of the platoon or battery. I was so afraid of these weapons that I practically lived on them in order to learn all that I could about the monsters. Most of the training and maneuvering occurred at night. You can imagine the anxiety of moving that tonnage through the darkness of a black night of mud slicked and soft terrain. We trained to fire one spot around, quickly compute correction data, fire the attacking rounds, and immediately displace. The majority of our daytime shoots were for demonstrations. Even the heavy equipment used to transport the M65 proved troublesome, as Major Luther Mitchell recalled, quote, in practice for moving the battery along the narrow and hilly roads near Stuttgart, Germany, uh, we were coming down a steep road single file with all of our vehicles, except fortunately as it turned out, our guns. In front was a jeep with a gun platoon leader lieutenant, and it was followed by a fully loaded ammunition truck in its trailer. The heavy ammo truck suddenly burst its transmission when downshifting, and a metal shard severed the brake lines, blaring its horn loud. It quickly became a runaway, forcing the jeep ahead to try and outrun the truck and its trailer. All three units sagely accomplished the one-mile downhill race, but the incident still remains burned in my mind. Deploying the weapons around populated areas also created other more unique challenges. According to Major James Miller of the 265th Battalion, while at Barmholder, Germany, we were forced to occupy firing positions off base because of the minimum range the gun could fire. We would be firing over villages, barns, roads, etc., and the villagers thought that it was like having boxcars flying overhead. Charges were made against the U.S. Army as a result. Farmers blamed us for chickens not laying eggs and cows not giving milk, and even said that the shells prevented women from getting pregnant. It took much explaining to satisfy everyone that the rounds rumbling in the sky were standard high explosives and not the feared atomic shells. But while the M65s never fired their nuclear shells in anger, their mere presence did have a measurable effect on the enemy, as Lieutenant Colonel Frank Hubb, who served in Okinawa, recalled, We were limited to only the roads available for deployment, and not much have been rebuilt since the end of World War II in 1945. Okinawa had one main highway going from the port in Naha to Kadena AFB, and that's about it. We fired from two old Japanese air bases, one at Yontan and one at Yanabere, due to the fact that the concrete runways could handle the weight. Prior to the arrival of the 280s, the the Chinese Navy would constantly come in to the three-mile limit on Okinawa to show their strength. After the gun arrived, we didn't see them again. Once we had a short round, which only went about a thousand yards, a conventional shell weighing 900 pounds of high explosive, and hit the East China Sea. It rained coral, seaweed, dead fish, and sea life, and the smelliest sea mud ever. This went on for what seemed to be a full five minutes. In the end, however, the M65 was obsolete almost as soon as it entered service, and the development of smaller nuclear shells for use in regular 8-inch howitzers, more mobile tactical nuclear missiles like the MGR-1 Honest John and the MGM-5 Corporal, led to the atomic cannon being quickly withdrawn from service, with the last examples being decommissioned in 1963. To this day, the M65 remains the only weapon to have ever fired a live nuclear artillery shell, and only the second gun-type weapon to have been detonated after Little Boy. Today, seven of the original 20 atomic annies survive in museums, Impressive, if impractical, monuments to the tense early days of the Cold War when East and West eyed each other warily across the Iron Curtain.